The topic today is small modular reactors and recycling carbon dioxide in the U.S. Navy. And, and I really want to hit, hit on this one. We're not talking about abating carbon dioxide. I'm not talking about reducing carbon dioxide. Let's recycle CO2 and let's use it over and over again. Small modular reactors actually are a reality today. Uh, they're used on aircraft carriers, they're used on submarines, and uh, for those of you who are ex-Navy ex guys like me, they were used in the cruisers, they're all gone. Uh, personal family history, my father served on the USS Long Beach and I was on the USS Mississippi. In 500 feet of ship, we had two small modular reactors that took care of everything. And by the way, we put millions of miles on that guy. I don't think a site license was necessary for those reactors. I seem to recall actually that we took them wherever we wanted in the world as long as it stayed wet underneath our feet. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, notably, one that I really want to bring up to everybody is uh, that name. No, I'm not talking about James Kirk. Uh, I'm talking about the USS Enterprise. She had eight reactors on board. It was the A2W. And David, where are you in the room here? I do believe that that W stands for Westinghouse. Okay? So, you know, small modular reactors can be built and they can be added in modules. This is historical fact, not a theoretic possibility. The Navy goes through enormous amounts of liquid fuels, just incredible quantities, and there's an entire mix of them, from gasoline and bunker fuel and diesel and JP5. Uh, it just goes on and on and on, the number of fuels that the Navy builds. Uh, the last data I've got in the public record is from uh, fiscal year 2013, uh, that between procuring and delivering fuel to the fleet at sea, the Navy was paying about $6.60 a gallon. That is more than we pay at the pump today. And that, that's a loaded cost, folks. Uh, in that year, they bought about 540 million gallons for a total of $3.5 billion. Uh, much more important, however, then those numbers is that there are, there are very serious logistics and on-station issues. Euler, out with the battle group, is constantly going up to the aircraft carrier and filling her tanks full of gas so they can keep the planes in the air, and then she circulates among the rest of the battle group except for one other asset, which is about 300 feet under the water, and everybody else is taking a drink from the oiler. As soon as the oiler is out of gas, she leaves. And she goes into some really unpleasant places like Aden and other parts in the world where they're not really nice to us and it fills up with as much gas as it can get as quickly as possible, actually a variety of fuels, and has to race back out to the battle group in order to keep everybody else out there drinking except for the carrier it still needs fuels for the aircraft and for that one asset that is under the water. Everybody else in the battle group is dependent upon the oiler for them to keep moving. So that's the, that the business case. It's not fundamentally about the money. It's logistics and on-station issues. However, $3.5 billion in spend is not trivial. So what's our opportunity? The Navy has plenty of small modular reactors. They're really good at them. And in fact, depending on where you want to look at the literature, supposedly they're on the 15th generation of small modular reactor in the Navy today. So we're not talking Gen 4, Gen 15 out in the fleet. Uh, there's lots of seawater around them, and we have this shortage of liquid transportation fuels. So the obvious business opportunity is how do we decouple the fleet from shore-based fuel? Uh, and the answer, unfortunately, is not to make every other ship in the battle group nuclear-powered. Because as Mike pointed out, um, there's nothing that you can do except put liquid transportation fuels into all the airplanes. And it's not just the carrier that's got them. Uh, virtually everybody else in the fleet's got a small hangar deck in the back. And the helos are going up and down and doing all sorts of vital missions. All right. So this is the work that's actually going on at NRL today. This is not a theoretical possibility. So... Uh, the ocean, or rivers as it's pointed out, is full of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, there's lots of this everywhere on the planet. In fact, seven tenths of the Earth's surface is covered with water. We were looking at here at the electro electrolytic cation exchange module. This is on version three. Here's the skid that's used down at Naval, uh, Naval Air Station Key West. And what's going on is pretty simple. We're pumping electricity into this, this module up here. We're pulling carbonic acid, HCO3, out of the water. And by the way, per unit gallon, we're getting about a 92% removal from it. And then we're using standard electrolysis to crack water in order to make hydrogen. 
And what do you do with it? Well, Steve was pointing out all the other neat processes he was talking about with high temperature. You string the carbon together with your hydrogen and let's get into the fuels business. And it's actually been very successful. Here is the spectrum for JP5, which is the standard fuel used to run all the aircraft. For those of you who can read it, this looks a bit like a classic bell curve. And what you're seeing is the spectrum based upon carbon content of the individual hydrocarbons as you make this guy out of oil. So this is, this is anybody, Exxon, BP, Shell, whoever you want to name it, pulling petroleum out of the ground, fractionally distilling it, and making JP5 according to the mill spec. So what happens coming out of our machine down at Naval Air Station Key West? Well, now look at this. We've got a decay curve. Because we're manufacturing the fuel synthetically, we're able to control the carbon content and get a better concentration of the C10 hydrocarbons that we want than you can get from actual natural gasoline. So what that tells, I mean, not natural JP5 made from natural oil. So what this turns out is that the synthetically made aviation fuel actually has a higher energy density and is cleaner. It doesn't have the sulfur compounds in it, it doesn't have the nitrates in it. All of the other really nasty stuff that comes out of burning a fossil fuel, we don't have, and we have a better power density profile, making this stuff artificially. If you do just basic high school chemistry, if we can get hydrogen and CO2 from seawater, you have the fundamental building blocks right there for making any hydrocarbon fuel you want. In fact, think of what you've got at the pump, although it wasn't on the slide. What, what are you, what's the rating on the gas pump where you filled your car? It says it's its octane rating, C8. The Navy's using something higher up the fuel curve. This is not a theoretical possibility. This is a toy airplane. It's not a real airplane, I admit it. However, you're looking at it in the air, flying on fuel that was made from seawater and electricity. So Mike, you pointed out that in the UK, the worst part of that tail end curve for 2050 is what do you do about civilian aviation, right? Are we gonna to move to a world where only the highest of our elected officials get to on an airplane and fly around the world and the rest of us get to walk? Because there is no substitute for aviation fuel if you wanna get in the air. We're not gonna have solar powered aircraft, we're not gonna have hydrogen fuel powered aircraft anytime soon. We're looking at some total radical technology breakthrough if you wanna fly. All right, economics. All right, here's the data that's in the, the paper out of NRL. So here's a breakdown looking at a, commu uh, a commercial nuclear plant, looking at capital costs on it. Uh, commercial nuclear coupled together with trying to make synthetic fuels and then a standard Navy light water, pressurized water reactor. And you can see the cost differences change. Uh, I won't bother to read through the whole tables on you, but let's get down to the bottom and look at total cost operation per kilowatt hour. So however you want to build your assumptions, seven cents a kilowatt hour should be a very reasonable number for anybody in this room to believe. What does that turn to then in our costs in order to make aviation fuel? In this case, on the commercial side, we're looking at something approaching six bucks a gallon. Use in the Navy light water reactor, which obviously has a slightly different cost structure, their compliance costs are very different than a commercial plant. Let's just admit it. This is not an apples to apples comparison for what can be done in the commercial world economically, but it shows what's possible. $2.90 a gallon delivered to the fleet making fuel at sea, making it artificially, completely decoupled from the petroleum market. First off, again, big takeaway, even from our Rolls Royce guys, yeah, SMRs are a reality. They're not in the civilian world today, but SMRs are, re are a reality on the planet right now. They really are. There are viable business cases that exist outside of electricity generation. Steve actually did a very good job of talking about some ones previously. Navy reactors, by the way, speaking from experience of being out at sea, they make lots of really nice fresh water. There was nothing better than getting off of the bridge watch, heading down towards my stateroom, and seeing the auxiliaries officer, and he says, Don, man, we gotta dump fresh water, the tanks are full. When you take your shower, just let it run. It doesn't matter today. I'm like, hallelujah, it's not a 30 second shower. I was ecstatic when we had tons of fresh desalinated water. And now think about the ramifications of this, because again, economics and politics really are crucial for us driving the industry here. You know, this is a green policy. I'm talking about a carbon 
neutral aviation industry. Because the, 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 the hydrocarbic acid in the ocean is in equilibrium with the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a very simple test. Seal up a fish tank, fill salt water in the bottom, don't let any air into it. Run your probes in there, pull carbonic acid out of the bottom, read your CO2 level in the air above it, and watch the CO2 level in the atmosphere drop. Every time you take a piece of carbon out of the ocean, it is the same as taking it out of the atmosphere. It will pass from the air into the water. So when you send an aircraft up in the air and it's running on fuel you made by taking carbonic acid out of the ocean, you have a virtual carbon cycle. You are not adding CO2 at all. It's carbon-free jet fuel that is carbon and burns in our existing engines. So it's a green policy. And then there are some geopolitical ramifications to separating transportation fuels from oil that's pulled out of the ground. I won't go any deeper into that. I'm sure your imaginations can run on that, you know, just as well as my can. So uh, last conclusion I want to put on there is, you know, obviously this needs to be scaled. Uh, the, the next module is going to be the EC4, and they're looking at a substantial cost reduction uh, per kilowatt hour on their hydrogen production. And obviously it also, in order to get into commercial, it's got to be scaled and be made robust. So there are some engineering issues to tackle here. Uh, last but not least, to my personal favorite on the MSR side, this is entirely with electricity generation. Give me David's reactor that runs 400 degrees hotter, even if it's all electricity generation, Carnot's cycle tells me with a much, with TH up here and TC down here, I'm gonna get better electricity production, I'm gonna have more energy I can put in this guy. Better, go, let's go Steve's route. Let's use high temperature motion, molten salts to directly disassociate the hydrogen from the oxygen in the water, and let's take electrolysis out of it. Now we're driving those fuel production cost numbers down even further. So in the very short term, is anybody gonna put one of these just out outside of New Orleans next to an existing oil refinery, it's not going to happen. Obviously, with the price of, of oil today per barrel, if you're anywhere near a serious oil resource, oil out of the ground is still cheaper. There are, however, a lot of places in the world and other business cases where you're nowhere near a refinery, you're nowhere near a source of oil. Think of, well, what's that little bit? Hawaii and other places where everything's got to be brought in completely on ships in order to support the island. Uh, you know, other places in, you know, remote parts of Africa, the coastline there, any place where you are disconnected from the petroleum industry, you drop a reactor in with one of these plants, you're making, you're in a new phase, which I like to call CFP. Instead of combined heat and power, this guy is combined fuel and power. Wouldn't it be great to make electricity all day long and make fuel all night long, and now your reactor's running 100%, 24-7, 365, meeting your needs. And ladies and gentlemen, that's my end. Dr. Rosenman, Knox, take us home. <laughs>